nature's dangerous decline. A UN report is warning planet Earth is being run on credit, with far more resources being used up than can be sustained, and ecosystems are being lost like never before. There is a rescue plan, but are we up to the challenge? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby here in Doha. Now, from oceans to forests and farmland, the world's ecosystems are being degraded and destroyed. And the UN Environment Programme says the situation is past the point where conservation alone can turn things around. At the moment, the equivalent of 1.6 Earths are needed to naturally supply what people are consuming. About 80% of the world's population live in countries running ecological deficits. And encroaching on animal habitats creates ideal conditions for pathogens, like the one that's caused the global pandemic, to cross to humans and spread. Or put another way, we are creating a big overlap area between animal and man for more coronaviruses. So, what do we do? For starters, well, the UN Environment Programme wants a generational restoration to rehabilitate a billion hectares of land over the next decade. That's roughly the size of China. And the head of the UN Environment Programme, Inga Anderson, told Al Jazeera it can be done. That billion hectares that we have overexploited, degraded through our human activity, we need to put it back into working order. Why? Because we still need to feed the world. We still need to ensure that we can live as humanity. And we can't do that if we continue to degrade the very land that sustains us. So the opportunity is, yes, we protect what has not yet been interfered with, but we put back into working landscape that which we have degraded. And it is so very doable. Each one of us know it from our back gardens. If we give the, or from the field, where we work. If we give nature half a chance, it will bounce back. It just needs a little helping hand. So this is a, an initiative where we are working with the finance sector. Obviously, we need to have farming on board, uh, governments, science and communities to move on restoration. But it will be essential for food and for climate. OK, let's bring in our guests today on Inside Story from New Delhi. We have Chandra Bhushan, CEO of the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology, or iForest. In Nairobi, Kado Sebunya, CEO of the African Wildlife Foundation. And joining us from Rome is Lorenzo Fioramonti, Professor of Political Economy at the University of Pretoria. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Chandra Busan in New Delhi, coming to you first. Take me through, explain to our audience why this is happening faster than it should be happening, and still it's happening fast despite all our efforts. Well, I think it is important to understand that there is a fundamental reason for land degradation, and the fundamental reason is poverty. A land is degraded because it is extensively used. And it is extensively used by poor people for food, fodder, and fuel wood. Now, if you want that land to be restored, you will have to provide alternatives. Uh, unfortunately, uh, over the last 30, 40 years, uh, we have not been able to eradicate poverty and therefore intensive use of land as we would have liked. And that is the fundamental reason why uh, degradation continues, uh, why deforestation is still uh, an important issue. And we need to pull a lot more resources and a lot more work uh, uh, if we want to reverse this trend. And therefore, I have a little difference of opinion with what uh, the unit is saying. Land is not the quickest, cheapest, or, or the easiest way to deal with. We have a historical experience of trying to reverse land degradation. And we have not been able to do it because we always think it is the easiest thing to do. Unfortunately, it is the toughest thing to do because largest number of people depend on land and they are the poorest people. So if we really want to reverse this trend, then we have to seriously think about how do we reduce poverty? How do we reduce intensive dependence on land? Then only 
And how do we mobilize resources for this? Then only we will be able to do it. Okay, that's a lot to talk about here on Inside Story. Kadu Sabunya in Nairobi. We're talking about farmland, we're talking about forests, we're talking about the impact on our oceans. Do we need to break it down into those three specific areas or should we just be calling it an ecosystem? Good evening. Thanks for having me. I'm mean, absolutely right. It's an ecosystem. It's, it's, it's a one health issue as, as we talk today. Uh, we cannot separate all those things. What pollutes the oceans comes from land. What pollutes land comes from the actions we, we take and the choices we make, like my colleague from Asia has just described. Really, land degradation is mostly driven by the choices we are making, either through fighting poverty or just greed uh, in, in terms of enrichment of the few people uh, that are driving the economies of, of this world. That is where really the issue is. It's an economic issue, but it's so much driven by the choices that human species is making in, in managing natural, resource, natural resources. Lorenzo Fioramonti in Rome, this document, this report, this clarion call for all of us to do something uses the word nature. Forgive me if what I'm about to say sounds very naive. In the context of what we're discussing here, what is nature? It does feel like a very old-fashioned word. Well, it's a very important one. It's all of us. We need to realize and understand that we're a part of nature. Uh, we have forgotten that for so long. And uh, I think COVID reminded us a little bit, right, that, you know, we die, we get sick. We thought we were not getting sick anymore. We die, we get sick. It's enough that we are out of balance with our natural system. And so we may experience tremendous, terrible economic consequences. And I think, you know, and I think I'm happy to be part of this debate and to be calling from Rome because I don't want it to become a debate about what the developing world needs to do, right? Um, land degradation has happened in the West long before it happened in Asia and Africa. Uh, deforestation has massively happened in Europe. Um, and so it's not just a problem for the so-called developing world, but it's a problem for everyone. And it's time that we start realizing that we need to reforest the world. We need to start rewilding cities in Europe. We need to start rewilding cities in North America. We need to start being in balance with ecosystems everywhere. This shouldn't be just a, a target, a task for um, you know, other continents. It needs to be a global effort. And when that happens, believe me, the ability that nature has uh, to restore itself, to progress quickly, and to counter some of the most um, you know, negative effects of, of climate change is, is extremely impressive. So we need to be part of the process. That's what nature is. We need to be part of nature and facilitate this restoration process. We're going to you know, enjoy the consequences, not just um, as, uh, as natural beings, but also as economic beings. It's going to be a good thing for the economy. It's going to be a, th a good thing for our personal health. Chandra Busan in New Delhi, that point that Lorenzo in Rome makes, I mean, Inga Anderson in the soundbite that we played at the top of the show, she kind of nails it. She says the planet can fix itself very quickly and it will fix itself, but we've got to give the planet the tools to do that. Did we see that or a glimpse of that during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic around the world? Talking about, uh, you know, um, Lorenzo was talking about rewilding our cities and our towns. We saw wildlife coming back into our cities and our towns around the world. We saw pollution levels drop. We saw aviation generated pollution levels drop. And we saw people soundbite after soundbite on this channel, on every news channel saying, oh, I used to live in a very polluted area. It's not polluted now because nobody's traveling anyplace. No, absolutely. I think uh, COVID did show us uh, what a clean environment looks like. Uh, in, you know, just 100 kilometers from Delhi, we could see Himalayas, you know, clearly, which, which we had not seen in a generation. So, yes, of course, people saw wildlife, people, you know, we had clean air and clean water. All that was good. But within a month of opening the economy, uh, we, shot, we saw a tremendous increase in pollution. Now, that also tells you how deeply interlinked environment is to the economic growth story that the economists you know, tell across the world. You know, it's an economist story. That's what it is all about. Now, historically, we have seen this. In the pandemic of 1916 as well, we, we had you know, improvement in environmental quality, and, and there is a written record of that. 
But post pandemic, we had the booming economy, the booming decay. After that, we had the crash of the share market in the US. So post pandemic has always been destructive to the environment. We also saw what happened in terms of stimulus during the pandemic period, where the investment in fossil fuels actually increased. So I am not sure that the world is learning the lessons from COVID. You know, it is very nice to speak about it that you know we all experience clean environment and that you know we, it, it is doable. But when it comes to the crux, both in terms of stimulus as well as in terms of policy, I do not see tremendous you know, movement towards green options. Okay, okay. Uh, let, let, let me just kind of boil that point down, Chandra, and put, I think, what you're saying to Kadu Sabunya in Nairobi. Kadu, I'm guessing you were nodding uh, quite um, enthusiastically there listening to Chandra Busan in New Delhi. I'm guessing here, from your vantage point, you need to see the developing countries being engaged in a dialogue with the developed countries. So the developed countries cannot adopt the, the sort of quasi ecosystem moral high ground here and tell the developing countries what to do, this is a two-way street of cooperation. Otherwise, inequalities will get greater, surely. Absolutely. And, 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 and I have bad news because the population of Africa at one point, about 1.2 billion people today, is going to double, more than double, in 30 years. Doubling the population of Africa and managing nature is going to depend on how Africa addresses poverty, like my colleague is said. What economic model is going to be developed? The choice Africa is going to make it, it is going to determine whether the, all the steps North America, Europe, and some parts of Asia have taken are addressing the global climate change, for example. If Africa chooses a different model of economy and is helped by the developed countries along the way, we shall have a better world. The idea that the world, the rest of the world, is going to fix climate change without helping the developing world to develop better, develop different from the, from the way Europe or North America developed. We are kidding ourselves. I'll give you an example. Currently, Africa is under one ton of, of carbon per, per person in terms of pollution. India is almost two. We have the similar population numbers. India is about 1.3 billion people, billion people, just like Africa is now. But the population of Africa is already determined in the next 40 years. It's already baked. Okay. We know that Africa is below 30 years old today, majority of Africans, and that population is going to double. And if they, pull, if they use energy at the current level India is using, we know that climate change solution is out of our way. OK, Lorenzo, let's I just go back to... The global... OK, pardon me for interrupting. I, I just want to go to Lorenzo in Rome now. Lorenzo, going back to that idea of rewilding our towns, our cities, our urban and our rural areas, the percentage statistics contained in this report make convincing reading because if you basically take 15% of industrialized, and I'm including industrialized farming here, industrialized land around the world back to what it used to be, you can stop, literally stop dead, 60% of predicted species extinctions by the year 2030. That's a very easy equation, and yet prime ministers, presidents, economy ministers, finance ministers, energy ministers around the world, they don't seem to be particularly engaging with a very simple message. Or, I mean, to put it another way, I think it was Gandhi that said, be the change you want to be and work with people, yeah? To paraphrase what Gandhi said or Michael Jackson said. Be or the change said, you want to see in the world. Yeah, some, be some, the change you want to see in the world. Nelson Mandela, some very clever guy, cleverer than I said that. How do we get people... No, it, how do we get people to do this? Do we tax them or do we incentivize them? 
Um, there are many tools. Um, let me let me also emphasize the fact that prime ministers and governments are wrong. Um, they've been wrong for a long period of time. I think our governments have been socialized into a different understanding of economic development. And I think more and more people are realizing that our concept of economic growth has to be completely rethought. Um, when our, my friends from, from India and from Kenya were saying, uh, you know, the developed world has to help the developing world, I would go even further. I would say the developed world has to take responsibility for what it has done, the damage it has generated, and also realize that it hasn't, you know, it's not it's not an example, shouldn't be an example for the rest of the world. And, and when you look at the whole planet, there are many interesting experiences. For instance, tools like payments for ecosystem services, paying farmers not to destroy nature, but to actually to, to restore and support ecosystems because ecosystems play a very important function in the economy. Um, you know, supporting governments and states that protect mother nature, that protect wildlife, and um, as part of a global taxation mechanism, we should have a global tax that should go, the proceedings should go to those governments that have wild, na um, sorry, nature reserves and so on and so forth. We should also have um, incentives because people react incentives to consume better, not to consume more, but to consume better. It's the shift between more and better means changing the world. And instead, because of our obsession with economic growth, which I consider a stupid economic model, we continue thinking that in order to develop, we need to consume more. We're generating waste, and then we have a lot of health and environmental issues to deal with. It's a very expensive system. So consuming better rather than consuming more. Our fiscal methods have to change. It's not hard. Interestingly, academics have long argued that we do have all the tools, the natural tools, the financial tools to do so. What is now missing is the political will. And I think this is the time after COVID for everyone to unite behind this report and behind these findings to say, we don't want to wait anymore. We want a better economy. We don't want to die of the next pandemic. We want to make sure that our natural conditions will be ideal for life. And we want to make sure that we're not going to experience so much poverty and so much deprivation because that turns into migration, that turns into a global problem. And it's, again, impacting okay. on our economy. If we want to save our economy, we have to save our planet. Chandra Bhusan, back to you in New Delhi. 0.1% uh, of global GDP would get us out of this toxic hole. But in case people think we're just all sitting here slagging off merrily international governments and prime ministers and presidents. Year on year, globally, we spend more than $130 billion on helping nature. Which countries are doing it right? Which countries are doing it wrong? I don't think any country is. This is a, it's not a black and white, uh, you know, answer here. I think some countries are trying to do right. They're getting it right. Others are not. But uh, frankly speaking, I think our over-reliance on government uh, uh, is also a problem. If we really want to uh, revive the nature, then the involvement of private sector and communities is, is equally important. We have seen, we have relied on the governments for the last 20, 30 years. We have seen what happens in international negotiations. I think we now have to give chance to communities and the private sector to come together and, and, uh, and provide a helping hand to revive the nature. And there are tools, both financial as well as institutional tools to, to, to allow communities to do it. We have seen experience from across the world that community management of forests is very successful. If you give rights to communities to sustainably manage forest and land, they do very well, uh, much better than what governments do. Uh, as far as private sector is concerned, I think we have to use both incentives and disincentives for them to work for nature. Right now, there is neither incentive for them nor enough disincentive for them not to destroy the environment. So apart from government, I think the time has come when, when the community and the private sector will also have to get involved uh, in, in getting our economics right and also making sure that the decade of ecosystem restoration that we are talking about has some degree of success. Kadir Sabunya in Nairobi, it would be uh, a foolhardy, perhaps, Kenyan prime minister that taxed people into being good for the planet. The same would apply to the Indian prime minister and also the Italian prime minister, and in my case, the British premier as well. But we spend, as a global community, we spend trillions of dollars a year looking after ourselves. So how do we repurpose that expenditure? So, say, for... For every thousand rials I spend in Doha, 10 rials goes to something that is good for the planet. How does that happen? 
I think the answer is going to be in changing this conversation, the way we talk about nature. We talk about nature as if it's separate from our aspirations, and somehow we are going to make money from something else to go and take care of nature. The, those two need to be brought together. Conservation or protection or managing nature is not an end in itself. We need to have a different separation so that we see that how we depend on nature in any form of life on earth. Whether it's in economic aspirations that we need to take care of, where water comes from, that we need for our factories, for our agriculture, and for our domestic use. We know where that comes from. We need to have a conversation of the things we need and how nature contributes to them. And forget about incentives that are going to come from somewhere else other than nature. The conversation, the right conversation is streamlining biodiversity in our livelihoods and in our needs and structure economies that rely on conservation and sustainability of our nature in order for us to, to have our livelihoods. I think that separation is where it has caused, taken us and brought us to where we are. Here in Africa, the conversation should be, how, how do we streamline? What's the role of biodiversity in Africa's aspirations? And once we answer that question, it will be easier for us to tax people. If you are in agriculture, 90% is rain fed on this continent. So what, what is that to do with forests? Okay, Lorenzo. If you, are, if you are in the industry, a big part of our energy is from hydro power okay. generation. Lorenzo, you know where that water comes from. It's from Lorenzo Fioramonte areas. in Rome. If this is not done, and done soon, because there's definitely a sense of urgency now coming from people like the report authors here. Is this a crisis that is irreversible? Potentially, yes. And it will have not only an existential, it will be not only an existential threat, but it will be also an immediate financial threat. I, you know, I understand that a lot of people don't care about existential threats. They don't care about planetary destruction, although I think intelligent species should actually care about it. A lot of people care about their pockets. Well, let me be very clear. If we don't take care of this crisis, we're going to have to pay a lot of money. Jobs will be lost. Livelihoods will be gone. Property values will drop. I mean, it's 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 already happened. I mean, look at Florida. You know, estate value and and properties have dropped in 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 market prices because of the risk of natural disasters. So the same as has happened is happening in Australia. Rich people have lost a lot of money for not taking care of. The, the, you know the land and the environment within which they live. So this is, I'm just, I'm trying to say this because it needs to be clear first and foremost that this is a problem for everyone. It's also a financial and economic problem if we don't take care of it. We can do. We should have done a lot years ago. We haven't done it because we have denied the crisis. Then we have postponed decisions. Now we're still, you know, dilly dallying, not not taking, not taking, sitting on the fence and looking at it. And this is becoming more expensive every every minute that we wait. And again, the report tells us that we know exactly what needs to be done. And what needs to be done is not going to lead us towards a worse, you know, personal, social, and human condition. It's going to lead us into a better economy. It's going to lead us into an economy that is going to be more prosperous and also that is going to allow us to thrive better. We're, we're not going to have to spend so much money to treat ourselves. We're not going to get as sick as we get now. We're not going to have so many social ills as we do have now. So it's a desirable economy. It's what I call a well-being economy. So not understanding this, which was the issue of separation, not understanding that if we separate human beings from nature, both are going to lose, is really an element of stupidity in, in our species. And I think overcoming that stupidity will be the most incredible, important step of our generation. Gentlemen, that's uh, an apt point to draw our discussion to a close. A thought-provoking conversation today. Thank you all very much for joining us. They were our guests, Chandra Bushan, Carlos Sabunia, and Lorenzo Fioramonti. And thank you, too, for your company. You can see the show again anytime you want via the website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also follow the chat on Twitter at AJ Inside Story is our handle. From me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha, Thanks for watching. We will see you very soon for the moment. Bye-bye.